Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Berg. Bob, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Oh, thank you, Layton. Great to be with you. Well, it is a an absolute thrill and, a, and a, uh, an honor to host you, Bob. This has been uh, a little bit in the making. Uh, you referred to me by the extraordinary Randy Gage, who I know is a good friend of yours, another great speaker, author. And uh, it's funny, you know, I was digging through some old emails and I registered for a, a, like a wealth making course uh, at the end of 2019 with, um, through your company, mm. which I must have watched. So uh, I've definitely had you on the radar for a little while. But, <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and for people that don't know, Mr. Bob Berg, uh, you need to start doing a little bit more uh, digging because this gentleman is a an award-winning speaker, a multiple published best-selling author of some extraordinary content. Uh, and amongst other things, comes from a, a background in radio and television, Bob. Yeah, wasn't wasn't particularly good at it. I was okay in radio. Uh, TV, I just wasn't. I, I was in radio as a sportscaster, which, you know, I was very comfortable with. Uh, when I moved to TV, it was in, in news. And I really wasn't very good at the news. I wasn't a journalist. I could read the news, but when it came to, you know, being a journalist, I just was not it. So I wasn't really long in television before I moved into, I like to say I graduated into sales. There's a direct correlation. I think there's a, a number of speakers that come from a similar type of background. And my father's a retired radio announcer. And I think oh. that's where I can maybe attribute some of my vocal ability from. Well, you have a great voice. Uh, I really think you sound like uh, Paul Hogan, who was, you know, Crocodile Dundee. Uh, and I, I, I thought that actually when I first heard you speak, I said, wow, he sounds so much like Paul Hogan. So well, great. That, yeah, you got those great, uh, great pipes, as we call them. Well, that's a huge compliment, uh, Bob. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll be sure to let Paul know that next time I speak to him. Um, I've never <laughs> spoken to him. I don't know him at all, but that's pretty funny. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, I'm because I'm actually a New Zealander originally, uh, Bob, but I've been living in Australia for 20 years nearly. So huh. the accents sort of been hybridised. Yeah. So did your dad do uh, radio in New Zealand or Australia? Both, both. So he was born in Australia, got an opportunity in New Zealand. That's where my my family came together, and uh, 40 year career. Wow. Wonderful, beautiful speaking voice as well. Oh, I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah, not not just my opinion, but the opinion of many. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm very blessed, very blessed. But Bob, uh, when we when we booked this session, uh, I know you're an incredibly busy dude, and uh, we've only got about half an hour. And I thought I'd throw you under the bus a little bit. I had a question: If you only had thirty minutes to live, mm -hmm. what would you do with the time? Oh man, it would it would. And this, this assumes I've been able to say goodbye to family and everything and, and so forth, because that would, of course, be my, you know, my first thing that I would do. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, I would, I would probably spend the 30 minutes doing the, the two things I enjoy most, which is reading and eating. So <laughs> I would uh, read a, a book that I enjoy and uh, have something to eat that I enjoy. And, and uh, I would, I would do that. I'd be fine with it. With well, the for, it's probably for the, not as deep as most people go with that, but that's a pretty, you know, it's like, what are you going to do in 30 minutes? You know, might, might as well go out and join yourself. Look, I think it's a great answer. And, and uh, something that, <laughs> that when I, when I was writing it down, I was like, you know what, I've never really thought about it like that. And I was, and I was thinking about maybe writing, uh, writing last notes that could be then distributed out for the people that I wasn't able to, to say goodbye to, I suppose. Um, and, and that's a good idea too. Well, I mean, I your it, idea is better than my idea. Mine's, mine's a lot more just kind of mundane. <laughs> well, I, maybe I think we're at different stages of our, our lives and our career as well, Bob, because for people that aren't able to watch this behind Bob is an extraordinary library of books, all of which I can only assume that you've read at least on one occasion. Yeah, most of them, I've either read it or used it as reference or, you know, referred to it. Uh, and this is one small part of my home library. I always like to say my home is comprised of books uh, with some scattered furniture. 
Well, one thing that's that's really struck me in the last four years or so, Bob, is I've developed this insatiable desire to learn. And I've read uh, more than 450 books in the last four and a bit years. Good for you. Good for you. That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And, I, and, and the reason I mention it is because it's changed my life. And and, and in, in, like you are the, about the 72nd podcast interview in, a, in 12 months. And I've read uh, the books, not all of everyone's books, because I know how many books have you published in your life now, Bob? Uh, I think 20? about 11 now. Something. 11, okay. I feel like you've been involved in more because there's some collaboration stuff uh, on Audible that I might have listened to. Hmm. Um, but you would know. So 11 books you've written, right? And, and the learning that I've garnered from these books has, has changed the course of my life. And I suppose your most famous book, The Go-Giver, and the spin-off series from that is just so wonderful. And, and yeah, thank you. I can't encourage people enough to, to, after you've listened to this, go out and listen or read to these, read these books. What is it about this book that you wrote, Bob, that has just been so impactful to you? Well, I mean, I, I think in a sense, and, you know, I, I co-authored it with John David Mann, so it certainly wasn't my work alone. And he was really a lead writer and storyteller because he's, he, he's a brilliant writer. I'm much more of a how-to person. So before I worked with John on this series, all my books before and since have been how-to books. And, you know, I can anybody can write a how-to book, write down what you know and, you know, organize it and so forth. And uh, so this was this was really different. This I got to have a, you know, a uh, collaborator and and it was really, uh, he did such a fantastic job. Um, really, I, I think the book had an audience because it, it sort of gave people permission to be a good person and, and successful at the same time. And sometimes, you know, we're, we're taught, we're, we're taught through the, uh, you know, Randy Gage, who our mutual friend who he talks about the the mind viruses, right, that the world places upon us in terms of negativity, in terms of anti-prosperity and, and lack thinking. And it, it kind of gives us this sense sometimes that you're either a good person or you make a lot of money, right? Uh, you're either a giver or a receiver, but not both. And of course, that's malarkey. <laughs> you know, that's, and, and, and I think most of us as human beings, we have a need to be able to, to give value to our world. We want to make a contribution. We want to feel like we're bringing something to the table. Uh, and we also want to make a very, very healthy living. And what the book basically said is, yeah, you can do both. In fact, the best way to make a lot of money is to provide a lot of value to the world around you, to the marketplace, to other individuals. That's why John David Mann and I say that money is simply an echo of value, right? And and so I, I think that's one reason why it took hold. And then we had the really the first adopters of the book were people who were already successful and were already living these principles long before the book ever came out, because there's nothing new about any of these principles. They've been around since time immemorial. And they and you know, they would write to us and say, This is what I've been trying to tell people, and you know, and so forth. Uh, and and they promoted the book to others, and it, it went like that. Then the second wave of people were the ones who received the book from uh, you know, their leader, sales manager, or, you know, somebody who just cared enough to give them the book. And and that's why I think it took out. I think that's why I think the message just resonated for that reason. Well, I, we won't have time to, to touch on all the points, but one of the things that was of most interest to me at this stage of my life was regarding finding the right mentor. Mm. Are you able to share with our audience the, that value? That yeah, and I agree with you. Finding the right mentor is just you know it can it can cut our learning curve tremendously, um, and we can connect with people today in ways we're able to to kind of get to people and, and and make connections with people in a way we never were before, and we have access to more people than we ever had before. I think it's still a matter of approaching the correct way, though that would cause a person who you'd like to mentor you to want to mentor you. Um, before you start. I, 
Before you start, Bob, sorry to cut you off. I'll, what I'd love to do is just show you um, a really quick example of something that I did last year, and I'll get you yeah. to critique what I did, because I okay. think this will be good for our audience, right? Long before I had the podcast, I'm a relatively new speaker, so I didn't have I didn't have a book, I didn't have a podcast, I didn't have a platform. I reached out to Brene Brown, and and I rang her. And I rang her on the equivalent of New Year's Day evening her time in Texas. <laughs> And she picked up the phone and she said, hi, Brene speaking. And I said, g'day, g'day, Brene. My name's Laban Ditchburn from Melbourne, Australia. I said, I'm an up and coming speaker. I said, we've never met before or spoken, but I've been instructed by all, all my other mentors to surround myself with people that are much further along the line than I. <clears throat> and I wondered if you'd be interested in sharing some ideas. And she said... <laughs> And she was like thinking, how the hell did this guy get my phone number? <laughs> and uh, and she said, well, Laban, thank you for your call. I'm about to sit down and have New Year's Day dinner with my family. But if you could send me an email, uh, I'll come back to you. And so she gave me her email address, her Gmail, and I prepared a one-minute video on uh, like YouTube and gave her the link introducing who I was. And this was when I was very raw. <laughs> and, she, and she responded back and she said, look, Laban, Thank you for getting in touch with what I've got going on with university and family. I don't have capacity, but I know you'll do fantastically. I wish you all the best, Brene Brown. Based on that information, Bob, how come she didn't become my mentor? Well, you've got to remember that someone like Brene Brown probably has dozens of people <laughs> every day <laughs> wanting to, uh, to do that. Now, here's how I would suggest um, if we were going to approach someone and not necessarily Brene or anyone else, because people are individuals and people do things their own ways. It sounded like she was very kind and graceful, but she also wonderful. Has, yeah. Um, but you know, she also knows what she needs to do in order to keep her life balanced and harmonious and, and correct and so forth. So, so here's my, my, um, uh, general suggestions, um, when it comes to asking someone, to mentor you. And, and first, I, I would never just suggest asking someone to be your mentor because the chances are, if you want them to be your mentor, probably a whole bunch of other people want them to be their mentor. So there's nothing that distinguishes you in that way. Now, by the way, you did distinguish yourself, certainly. I mean, I can't think of how many people could have gotten her number and would have even called had they had her number. So, uh, so I'm sure you did that fine, but... Uh, but a lot of times what people will do, Laban, is they'll say to somebody, you know, hey, would you be my mentor? And what I think we have to understand is a mentor-protege relationship is just that. It's a relationship and it takes time to build, right? And so if we just say, will you be my mentor? It's sort of like saying to somebody, hey, will you, you, know, will you share your 30 years of experience with me, even though you don't know me from a hole in the wall. And, you know, it's like, again, I've heard the, the um, analogy of asking somebody to marry you instead of asking for a date first. Okay. Cause again, it's a, it's a right example, but here I think is what, what we can all do and which is, has proven to get very good results. And that's this, you could approach pretty much anyone and say um, that, you know, if you're, uh, I know you're very busy. So if this is something we either don't have time to do or just for whatever reason don't want to, I'll absolutely understand. I'm wondering if I could ask you one or two very specific questions. Now, we've, we've done a few things um, it, 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 when asking that way that increases the odds of engagement. One is we have approached it from a place of, hey, I know this is a big ask, uh, so we're not, uh, you know, just assuming that they would be able to. We're saying, you know, if you don't have the time, if you, and and we're giving them the out or back door. You know, we're coming right out and saying, I respect your time, and I understand if, if this is just not something you have time to do or even want to do. Absolutely, I would understand. I call this the law of the out or back door, which simply says the bigger the out or back door you give someone to take, the less they'll feel the need to, because they understand that you have their time and, and respect in 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 mind. Um, what you've also done the way you, when you said one or two very specific questions is rather than as most people do, 
uh, where they say something. I don't know if you say this in Australia, but up here in the States, we say, can I pick your brain? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Which, yeah. Which means I want to. And so what does that say to somebody? You don't really have anything in particular in mind. You just want to ask a whole bunch of questions in there. But when you say, if I may ask you one or two, I wonder if it's possible if I might ask you one or two very specific questions. Now you're saying to them, okay, this is going to be short. It's going to be sweet. I'm not going to take up a lot of your time. And I know what I need to ask, right? And so in that person's mind, it's, wow, this is a serious person. They know what they need. Now, so most people, not, not all, and remember, everybody has different reasons for everything, and you never know what a person's situation is. But most people, when you uh, approach like that, will say, you know, sure, what, what, do you need or, or what can I help you with? Because uh, again, they know it's not going to take a long time. Now, uh, at the and so make sure that you do just not take a long time, be very specific, make sure, of course, you research that person totally so that you don't ask anything that you could have found the answer to through researching them. But but I know that would is something that, that you and all your, your viewers would do. Um, but at, as soon as the call, you know, as soon as the, the that conversation has taken place, you want to end by, you know, thanking them and letting them know how much their how helpful their wisdom was, and uh, and you might say, uh, if it's okay, I'll I'll check back in with you down the road and and let you know how I'm doing, and they'll probably say, yeah, sure, let me know. Now, that very day, as soon as actually as soon as get it, you get off the phone or the Zoom or whatever you're you're on or in person, where whatever it happens to be, I would write a handwritten personalized note of thanks, very short and sweet that just says, you know, thank you so much again for taking time out of your busy schedule to counsel me. Uh, your, your wisdom is just so helpful and I look forward to applying it right away. Uh, I'll circle back and, you know, or I'll keep in touch or I'll let you know from time to time how, how I'm coming along or I'll keep you up to date with my progress. That's even actually a little better. Best regards. And then now I'd put it in, in a regular envelope, put the stamps on it, send it out and that's a nice touch. Another thing you can do, and this will make a really great impression, is to, you find out, and again, you can do this through researching them on the internet, or there's always a way to find out. It might be from asking their administrative assistant, but whatever, easy to find out what their favorite charity is. And uh, let's say it's their, their local um, animal rescue uh, shelter. Okay, and so you make a, a small, it doesn't have to be anything big, but you make a small donation in their name. Uh, it'll get back to them. And uh, so they'll know you did that. You're not doing it to, you know, kiss up to them or, or uh, you know, but just because you're letting them know that you are thankful, that you respect the process and that you're grateful to them for what they shared with you. And that even though you can't give to them in the, the same way they're giving to you right now, you wanna do your part. Um, and then you might, you know, again, a few weeks later, you know, you follow up and just let them know how you're doing and, and maybe you have another question. And in time, if a mentor protege relationship is supposed to develop, it will, if not at one, I, you know, you can't be attached to the outcome. You just do, you know, what you, it might be that you have a conversation or two with them and then with someone else and someone else. And eventually you come across someone, it ends up, you have a great long-term mentor protege relate, you know, you never know, but that's how I would go about it. That is genius. And for people listening to this, if you don't heed that advice, you got rocks in your head because <laughs> that is brilliant. And, oh, and thank you. it explains perfectly why there was never any chance that Brunei was going to say, Hey, you know what? I've got a whole you know weekend free. Why don't you pop on over? Right. But you know, but uh, you know, you, you still, you, you reached out, you took action and it's so, and what you did is so important. It was actually very courageous, you know? So uh, kudos to you for, you know, for doing that. Uh, anyone well, who will take that kind of action is a is is someone who is or and or is going to be very very successful at, at what they want to do. Well, I, I really appreciate that, Bob, and, and I've affectionately been given the nickname by some very close friends of mine, Dino Balls, uh, which is incidentally the title of my second book that I'm writing, um, Dino Balls: How to Kill It at Life by Being Braver Than Everyone Else. <laughs> and um, and I'm creating a, a teachable uh, course at the moment um, to encourage people to to be brave and what what great things can happen because 
even though nothing happened with Brene, it really set me on this pathway of thinking, do you know what? I can speak to Brene. I can speak to anyone else. And it's it's allowed me to become comfortable not being overawed or becoming sycophantic sure. to people like yourself, Bob, who Absolutely. have these extraordinary careers. And I, I want to ask you a question regarding your own experience finding a mentor if you're at liberty to do so, because I'm sure you've had a lot of mentors over the course of your extraordinary career. Is there any particular example where you've been able to develop a relationship using that exact methodology that you just spoke about? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I've been very, very fortunate that while I've never had, you know, one business mentor, so to speak, I've always had people who were so, so very helpful to me along my career path. I mean, just, you know, uh, and I always generally approach them that way. I always tried to find ways I could give to them as well, that I could find ways of being of value to them. But a lot of times I wasn't in that position at first to, you know, to be able to do that. But I always reached out in that particular way. And I always found them just very, uh, you know, very welcoming. So again, I, I consider myself extremely fortunate in that regard. What about the name Zig Ziglar? Oh, the best the best. He was, he was such a wonderful man. You know, it's the years ago, uh, I used to hold an event uh, where I would invite a whole bunch of speakers in and, you know, we'd have you know, usually a few hundred in the, the audience and so forth. And uh, Zig came and, and cause we were actually presenting him with the first annual go giver appreciation award. And, you know, he's the, the ultimate, you know, his, uh, and at that time, and I don't know if you know, the last couple of years of his life, he had had a, uh, an accident, uh, which gave him very short term memory loss and it was severe. So his last couple of years speaking on stage, he would always be accompanied by his daughter, Julie, or his son, Tom. We uh, had Tom on the of, podcast, actually. He, yeah. Tom, Tom is just such a wonderful guy, just carrying on his dad's legacy in such a respectful way and oh I just uh, an amazing family amazing yeah so so you know we were on stage and we awarded you know zig and afterwards zig and mrs ziggler the one he calls the redhead in his in his and tom were they were signing autographs and speaking with people it must have been for an hour and a half they just didn't stop until the last person had a chance to talk to them. And I'll tell you, for weeks after the conference, the emails I was receiving from people were that as much as they loved, you know, all the speakers and all the, the time that they got to spend with the Zigglers, connecting with them and seeing that they were the exact same people off stage as Zig, you know, writes in his, his books was just such a, a wonderful experience. So, you know, when I think of Zig Ziglar, just not only a, a hero in terms of the information and how much I got to learn from him, but just how he was such a, just a, a wonderful, wonderful human being. On that note, Bob, I'm partial to an impression. And if you can guess this one, then I'll ask you kindly to do your favorite impression of okay. Mr. Zig Ziglar. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, you, <laughs> are you talking to me? <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> Is that the Australian, the, the land down under version of Robert De Niro? I just need the mole on my face and, uh, and it'll be oh, almost that complete. Is funny. <laughs> but I would love for you to share with our audience your extraordinary impression of Zig Ziglar and his famous quote. Uh, well, see, you can have everything in life you want. Uh, if you just help enough other people and get what they uh, want. Oh, that Southern drawl. There wouldn't be many, there wouldn't be many that could do a bit of that. I reckon, Bob, what are your thoughts? I don't know. Andy Andrews, who's a great speaker and, and author, he's written some fantastic books. He actually, I think, uh, and I have not heard it, but I, I think he actually did a whole cassette, uh, not cassette, an audio with Tom. Uh, and he did Zig's voice. Andy did Zig's voice pretty much throughout the entire thing. And, uh, and I have no doubt Andy could do it a lot better than I do because he's just a brilliant everything. And, uh, <laughs> but, wow. uh, but yeah, Zig's voice was certainly, he just had that, you know, that, that wonderful Yazoo City, Mississippi, Southern drawl that, boy, did it just. 
<laughs> it's another guy with just a great voice right you know uh, yeah it's it's melodic and hypnotic i just lo- i love that stuff bob i am super conscious that you are a very busy man as i mentioned earlier you've got lots of, lots to go and do but before we wrap this up is there anything you'd like to leave our audience with you know i'm reminded of a uh, of a person if you want to call him a mentor with my friend Don Scumachi, who's a great leadership speaker we we call these kind of people drive by mentors and this is a person who you may not know well may not have a relationship with might have spoken with them one or two times maybe never but they happen to come along at the exact right time when you needed to hear something and they're the ones who said it and it, it reminds me of, you know, I was in, had been in sales for a couple of years and had done pretty well, but I had moved to a new company, uh, was selling a, a high uh, ticket item and I was in a sales slump. And instead of focusing on the customers I should have been, I was focusing on myself and, you know, I was so desperate to get out of the slump. And, you know, this is almost 40 years ago now, but I remember it as though it were yesterday. And this older gentleman at the company where I work, he wasn't even in the sales department. He was in a whole other department. Uh, I knew him just from, hello, how are you in the hallways? And I don't remember ever speaking with him again. But he said to me, can I, I think he saw me where I was, that I was sort of like Joe in the Go-Giver that I'd write about years later. I uh, ambitious, aggressive and up and coming, but working hard, but very frustrated that I was not having the results. And he said to me, Berg, he was a last name kind of guy, Berg, can I give you some advice? And I said, uh, yeah, absolutely. Please do. I I really need it. And he said, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target, he said, is serving others. Now, when you hit the target, you'll get a reward and that reward will come in the form of money and you can do with that money, whatever you choose. But never forget, he said, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It isn't the target itself. Your target is serving others. And that was a difference maker for me. That was a, that was a big change for me. That's where I saw that great salesmanship is never about the salesperson. Great salesmanship is never about the product or service, as important as those are. Great salesmanship is always about the other person. It's about those whose lives you're able to add value to. It's about making the other person's life a little bit better just by you being in it. And that, that made all the difference to me. Wonderful, Bob. Absolutely wonderful. Where can we find you? Uh, the best place is Berg, B-U-R-G dot com, where all the information is. Get to, get to Berg.com. It is a wonderful resource. There's loads of free stuff on there as well. Read The Go-Giver. Read the other Go-Giver books as well, and your life Thank will you. improve exponentially. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Berg.